All right. Uh, the last film that I'm going to be reviewing tonight is... Onward. So Onward is a film that got a theatrical release a few weeks ago, and because of the events of the beer bug, for lack of a better expression, because YouTube doesn't like when we talk about the real world, um, it, because of that fact, had to be pulled from theaters, and Disney decided to release the film video on demand for a little while, and then put the film out onto Disney+. Plus. So if you have Disney+, Plus right now you can watch it with no extra fees attached to it, and I would say you can skip this movie. If I had to be honest about the movie, I would say you can skip it. So let me just go into some uh, some basic premise things. So it deals with this magic-filled world, or at least it was magic-filled, until industrialization took all of the magic out of the world. And that was the first problem that I had with the movie, because it obviously tries to take it into a, oh, things were so much better before industrialization and capitalism came into the world where you could turn on a light and you could buy products. And I, I felt like, and maybe that's me digging too much into it, but I felt like it was very clear in what it was doing. It was trying to have that mindset. I think that's like the main point of the story is, oh, there's so much magic in the world. Isn't it so sad that industry has destroyed that magic? So that's how it starts off. And at that point, oh boy. Um, uh, it didn't start off very well for me. So yeah, I put industrial revolution slash capitalism is wrong is what I'm gathering from the very beginning of the movie. Um, and that it destroyed magic is kind of the mindset of what it goes into. Uh, so eventually they, uh, in the beginning of the film, they show these different people with magic. They show the wizards, they show, uh, you know, various, uh, peoples with the staffs being able to handle it. There's one character that is clearly, a ripoff of Gandalf, has the same beard, like Gandalf the Grey has the same beard, has the same hat, has the same everything, and literally the only thing keeping him from being Gandalf was him saying, Wizard, you shall not pass! That is the only thing missing from it being basically a total ripoff of Gandalf. So I noticed that in the early part when they showed the magic before industrialization and capitalism destroyed everything, by the way. Um, but I will say this much. The animation was very pretty, but... When I was watching it, I thought to myself, is Disney Pixar ever going to actually add something new? Because I feel like they've reached this point now where anytime you go into a Disney Pixar film, you expect a certain type of animation. And I just feel like, is it getting old? And that's, I think, the reason why I loved Klaus so much because Klaus did... I found this out later, actually. Klaus actually had hand-drawn animation that was put in together with CG work. And it worked so well together that it just looked fresh. It looked different. It looked unique. And looking at this film, I said, this just looks so generic now because we've gotten so many Disney Pixar films and they all have that same animation style. And so I wrote that down and said, are we getting, is this getting old, right? Is this animation style getting a little too old? The voice acting for the most part, very well done. Uh, Chris Pratt play, plays, uh, plays the older brother. Um, who is kind of goofy throughout the film. And then uh, Spider-Man. Uh, oh my goodness. Why am I blanking out on his name now too? Lord. Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. Yes, right. That's right. I'm doing it live. I'm looking it up live. Because that's just what I do. And as soon as I see his name, I'm just like, oh, I know this. Tom Holland. There it is. Uh, so Tom Holland plays the younger brother. Uh, Tom Holland, I think, is the star in this film. Uh, because he just doesn't really sound a whole lot like itself. He puts on a certain way of speaking. Um, Chris Pratt does to an extent as well. But for the most part, the voice acting is pretty spot on. However, my question and, and my other issue with the film comes down to it being one thing. Is this supposed to be a kid's movie? Because it doesn't feel like it. Even though, like, basically I feel like this film has an identity crisis. Because there's time in the movie where I think, okay, kids are going to love this. But then there's other times where it goes very dark, very quickly. You know, it deals obviously with the loss of a father. It deals with all the different issues that come up with that. It deals with a kid who's getting bullied, not, not necessarily getting bullied, but a kid who is completely alone and isolated, who has no friends. And he's 16 years old. And so I'm looking at that, I'm thinking to myself, is this supposed to be this dark this early on? Like I said, is this really for kids? It was actually uncomfortable how dark it was. Because you're surrounded with all of this, you know, Disney-fied fluff, but then they're trying to also shove down this really dark story. And and I'm thinking to myself, I'm wondering if this was not doing well, because this was not doing well before everything happened with the beer bug. 
I'm wondering if one of the reasons why people were not going to see this film was one, because of the marketing, but also two, because it was a darker film. Because remember, Dumbo came out uh, last year or within the last couple of years, and that's been the only Disney live action, live action quotations film that has come out from them that has actually lost money. And one of the reasons why I think it lost money was because it was a darker film. And I'm wondering if that's the reason why Onward also didn't do as well, because it has this darkness to it, but it's almost uncomfortable about how dark it actually is. You know, it's down and depressing, and I don't think that's what a Disney Pixar film should be. It's different when you have a film like Up, for instance, when they tell you this beautiful love story between these two characters, and then you have that dark moment. But the dark moment only lasts for like maybe, what, five minutes before they start to inject some comedy elements into it, bring some life into it. Onward doesn't really do that. It, it, it takes its time. And with a film like this, you really can't take your time spending that much time in darkness and depression because it just really shouldn't do that. Uh, the film also has a very, very boring middle. I actually fell asleep uh, by the middle of the movie because it was very boring. Um, you know, from the beginning, it wasn't very interesting. It was dark and depressing. But then as it goes on, it just is very boring to the point of me falling asleep. And so I had to <laughs> take care of that once I woke up. But even with that, though, it somehow is able to pull off a beautiful ending. I don't know how it does it. I don't know how any of it works. But there is this ending that they pull off. Because the whole premise of the film is that uh, their father has died. You know, from you know years ago, their father died. Uh, the younger brother, voiced by Tom Holland, hasn't ever really been, a, you know, never really met his father, never really knew his father, while his other brother did. His other brother has a couple of memories. And so basically they find this, or rather their mother gives them this staff, um, and they find out that their father was a wizard, and that there is a spell that his father wrote that will allow them to see their father for one more day. During the spell, things happen, and only half of their father comes back, and you only have the legs of the father, right? And so the whole journey of the film are the two brothers going to try and find this stone that will allow them to say the spell one more time and basically fully complete the father. And so the ending of the film goes in a direction that is different than what you would expect it to be, and it actually is quite beautiful. The problem, though, is that you've got this dark, depressing beginning, this terribly boring middle, and then it all leads to this beautiful ending, and I thought to myself, what in the hell did you do? You had all of the potential in the world, you had a very interesting premise, and you blew it. And you totally blew it. Uh, so, uh, for this movie, I give it a C-. minus. Um, I think it's definitely one of the one of my least favorite Disney Pixar films to come out. And it has everything to do with the fact that it's one, it's got that apparent political messaging it's trying to get about in the very beginning. Because also, at the end of the movie, guess what happens? At the end of the movie, um, because magic is now back in the world, oh, now we don't have to use our technology as much. Oh, now we can, you know, uh, as uh, one of the cops, uh, for instance, is a, was it a centaur or minotaur? Uh, one that's like part horse, part uh, part something else. And so in the beginning of the movie, there's a comment made saying, oh, your species used to be able to run 70 miles an hour. And they're like, oh, well, I can drive a car. And so at the end of the movie, he gets called into a case and he says, oh, I don't need to take my car because I can just walk there. I can just run there. Uh, so that might be lo me looking to a little bit, but it has that kind of under, you know, in the very beginning, it's a lot more obvious, I would say. That. So there's a political messaging to it in the very beginning, a uh, very boring middle to the point of me falling asleep. And then the ending is beautiful. So it's just this cacophony of noise and of madness. And so uh, overall, I think I think giving the film uh, a C- minus is fair. Um, I give kudos and props to the voice actors. I give kudos and props to the animation department. Because even though the animation has become very sterile at this point, um, I, I really hope that the movie, the next Pixar movie to come out, Soul, um, has more soul uh, to it. Because you can't just have a good movie because your ending is good when your middle sucks and your beginning is just downright depressing. And now for a huge shout out to all of my November Patreon and Subscribestar members, Albertus Magnus, Animation Commentator, Brian P., David Bobrizic, Dion, Divex, Enrique Evangelista, Father Christopher Miller, Hail Father, Father Damien Cook, Frank the Tank and the Shawhan Wiener Dog Clan, Harold Francis, the Hunky Chunky Funky Monkey, Inflamed Wood, it's a Trap Productions, Jason Clark, Jacob Juice, Jay, Jeffrey Toon, Jonathan Carney, Kenneth Cameo, Laura Story Times Two, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mike Jackson, Mr. Peabody and his evil twin, On to June, 
Orange Hat Reviews, Out of Step with Reality, Outpost Dyer, Riff Magos, Rosetta Allen, Steve Glasker, Teresa Martin, or Miss Martin Muses, Theodore Benden, Tina Bojan, and Tina B. the Empress of the Universe, and Garrett Searles, and Cash the Butcher. Thank you all for being my Patreon members, and a shout out, of course, to my subscribe star members Stand For, John B., Perpetual Punster, Robert Revo, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, Darkstar57, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., US888209 Fast, Dean Heiss, J. Rod the Beer Guru, Nabadon G. Adams, and ZK Man, and Andrew Hoyle. Thank you to my subscribe star and Patreon members for supporting me for this month. I hope that you are enjoying your perks of getting access to things like a podcast, to giveaways, and also, of course, to other exclusive content. I know I've fallen a little bit behind with the birth of Baby Thor, and so I thank you very much for your patience and, of course, for your continued support. You guys are all amazing and beautiful people. Have a wonderful day, and as always, God bless.